Kai! Salute to the front! Salute! Alrighty, um... I'm telling these stories for George. Now, George is a documentary maker and uh, he's seen a bit of my uh, stuff on video and he's like, yeah, 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 we want to do a doco. So, I've thought about it overnight and I'm happy to do one. You know, we're going to do Somalia, the stories from Somalia. Um, the PTSD afterwards, the coming home and the trying to fit back in, the suicide attempts, the drugs, the booze, and the broken relationships, you know, we'll, we'll have it all together. So George, I'm doing this one today, like you've seen my other ones, I put a few up on your Facebook page this morning. Um, I'm going to say these on video now. So, you know what to ask me when you come and see me, you know, it's like, because I feel once I've expressed it, it's really hard to get your, your, your juju back and uh, say it again, you know, and I'm trying not to swear, that one that I did where I'm swearing a lot, it's really hard to tell a Somali story without swearing, because swear words were used a lot in the army, like when it's, when it's hot, it's hot. But when it's fucking hot, we know how hot it is. So, all right. I'll tell you a good story about Somalia. We were on patrol, we'd been in country two months. One section, nine of us were on patrol in Baidoa. And this well-dressed lady, a Somali lady, approaches us and she goes, could you follow me, please? So we're like, okay. So we go into this, this newly built building by the engineers and we go in there and there's 30 grinning kids. We're like, what's up? She goes, I'm their teacher and they, have, uh, they want to sing you a song. They want to sing you a song. So we're like, you know, we're standing there with our big guns and we stink and, you know, really heavy hitting guys. And these 30 kids arced up singing, you know, and we're like, wow, that is so beautiful. And they sung it in Somali. So at the end of the song, we all clapped and cheered. And, and I said to the teacher, what was that all about in Somali? What's it, what is it in English? And she said, they were thanking you for making it safe to go back to school again. And uh, I, I, I was blown away, you know. I never knew that, that my time as a grunt in Somalia made it safe for kids to go back to school, you know. Like, I, I hadn't even thought about that part, you know, but it made us feel proud of the job we were doing, you know. Um, another time, we were, uh, we're in country about three months because we were nearly going on R&R. &R. And uh, we, we took a, a APC into, a, into the start of a creek line. Then night, one section, my section, patrolled down the creek line during the day in the, in the scrub. And uh, we got to a high point just out of the village and we were watching a water well, a water point. Now, all night we watched five bandits with AK-47s charge people for water. So, the next morning, the next morning we had an O group uh, we all were given a man to, to get each, you know, five of us were chosen to tackle their gunmen and uh, we had an order group and we broke, broke our OP and come bolting down the hill yelling, put your fucking weapons down. Anyway, I was out the front, I was the front of the group and I'm running with my weapon 
at five Somali gunmen with AKs yelling out, put your bloody weapon down. And I could see in their eyes, they were thinking about firing, right? They were thinking about it. So bang, I grabbed my guy, tackled him to the ground, kicked his AK-47 away, and put my gun to his head and said, gotcha. So I looked around and the other four gunmen were down. And uh, this is phasing in and out. The other four gunmen were down and the boys were giving them a bit of a touch up, you know. So I turned to my Somali bandit and said, it's your lucky day you got me. Right, because I'm a bit of a pacifist. But running at five armed men yelling out, put it down, is very dangerous. You know, at the time I didn't think much of it, but later in life now, I'm 51, I think, that was pretty hairy, Normie. Uh, another time we're doing a roadblock, we'd been in country about a month and a half, and we had a roadblock up on the highway, we were searching vehicles for weapons. So, this bus pulls up, and I said, I'll get this one. So I jumped on board, and I look up the back, and there's 10 people there with horrified looks on their faces. Right, they were, they were stunned. And then I looked down the corridor, and there was blood everywhere. Then I looked at the seats of the bus, and they're full of bullet holes. And I noticed there were drag marks in the blood. So I said to the bus driver, what happened? And he said, oh, we, we got ambushed down the road. We got ambushed down the road by bandits. So, so I said, naturally, where's the dead people? And they said, oh, we, we threw them off the bus in the desert. I was like, fuck me dead, man. Like, not even the dead get any respect in Somalia, you know? Just throwing off the bus in the desert to be eaten by a buzzard. You know, no respect for the dead, but that was Somalia, you know? You catch a bus and you could be gunned up and killed. You know, that's how dangerous the place was. But, um, another night. We were on patrol. The whole of seven platoon. And we're on our way to a village to do a raid. All 30 of us, right? And uh, it, was, it was about midnight, it was a full moon night. I'll never forget the full moon. Anyway, we're going through a sorghum field. Sorghum's their food which wasn't growing too well because because um, it hadn't rained for seven years. But um, we're all in line patrolling through the sorghum fields and it comes down the line to halt. So we all halt, spacing between us, facing out. Then it comes down the line that we're possible, we're, we're lost. So back in 1993, it took an hour to get a grid reference off a uh, GPS because there's only a certain amount of satellites. So we waited the hour, got our grid reference, and then it come down the line, we're possibly in a minefield. So I was like, well, fuck me dead, I'm in a minefield. You know, it's like one of the worst predicaments to be in, you know? Like in a minefield, it doesn't have a sign saying you are now entering a minefield. And it doesn't have a sign saying you are now exiting the minefield. So, so I'm, we're all like, wow, you know. And then the order come down the line to step in each other's footprints. And lucky it was a full moon night because uh, we could see each other's footprints in the dirt, you know? So, that's what we did, you know? And we're all tiptoeing through the sorghum field, waiting to go bang, you know? It's, it's, it's hilarious when you're older, but 
at the time it's pretty scary, you know. But yeah, 30 grunts tiptoeing through a sorghum field on a full moon night is, uh, yeah, it's one for the records, you know. And I'm not blaming the boss for getting us lost because, it, you know, there's no, there were no geographical mountains or knolls or forest or creek lines. There's nothing to go on, so it's hard to read maps in Somalia. Another time, we were in country about a month, three weeks actually, and we went to this new village. And the whole platoon's mounted on 6 B vehicles with six wheels, back to back, facing out, you know, 12, 12 guys on each uh, vehicle. So we hit this village. We hit this village and we disperse off the vehicle slowly and we look for weapons and we don't get any. So the boss comes up with an idea. He says to us, righto, we're going to drive out of town two clicks, wait half an hour, then drive back in really fast disperse fast and get the weapons. So we're like, righto boss, our fearless leader. So we go out of town two clicks and we're parked on the side of the road waiting. So I'm sitting there waiting and I look down at the ground and then I look at our tyre and I was like, holy fucking batshit Robin. Our tyre was right on the edge of a tank mine and it tips it out of the sand. Like one inch over, it would have hit the pressure plate and would have killed and maimed us all on the back of that truck. You know, I was like, holy shit. So I told the guy next to me, he looked and he shed bricks too. And then the order to go, go, go was given. So we didn't even get time to tell the other boys on the back of the truck or the driver that if he'd gone one inch over on that steering wheel, we would have all been dead, you know? Like, that's how close we come to dying that day, you know? That that would have been really bad, a, mo a tank mine going off under a vehicle, you know? It would have ripped their arms and legs off, so that didn't happen, thank God, and today I still think about how God, you know, protected a lot of Australians over, well, not God, call it what you want, Mother Nature, you know, archangels, whatever you like, an angel. But yeah, something protected us that day, so. All right, I'll tell you another story. We're in, we're in country two months, and we're at Barakaba, and we've been doing, we've been doing, um, day patrols all day and we're, we're back at our little base we set up at, in the uh, in the um, industrial area. Anyway, it's just on nearly dusk and this Somali comes charging in going, my camels, my camels, they stole my camels. So my sergeant goes, which way do they go? And he points out into the desert and uh, he goes, Chapman and your section, get in that APC and go get those camel stealers. And we're like, oh, righto. So we'll pile in the APC and take off across the desert. Anyway, we've been going for about an hour and a half and the carrier speeds up. So I thought they've spotted them. So the back door goes down, I bolt out. The boys bowled out, I tackle one of them, and the boys tackle the other guy. So I've got my rifle to this guy's head, and he's he's pretty young, you know, he's only about 16. And he starts crying. So I took my weapon away from his head and patted him on the head, and I give him a cigarette and said, you'll be all right, mate, I'm not gonna hurt you. So anyway, the boys hogtied the other guy and threw him in the back of the APC, then they come for this guy. 
So I pulled the cigarette out of his mouth, put my gun back to his head, we hogtied him, threw him in the back, and tied the camels to the APC, and then went back at camel walking pace. So we got back at midnight. So we're feeling pretty successful, you know? We got the camel stealers and the camels. So we go up to the Somali and go, here's your camels back. And he goes, wrong camels. We were like, what? We just spent five hours getting these guys, scared the absolute shit out of them, and they're the wrong fucking camels. Far out, that was a mission. I'll tell you a story about Private Flatley. Right, they're um, Boom Boom Billy section. Private Flatley was the forward scout. And uh, he was up the front, it was night. They were in by Doha doing patrols. They were down the back lane ways. And Flatley come to a T intersection in the dark, you know? So he's turned to see which direction he, the corporal wants him to go. And just as he's turned, a Somali's jumped out and sprayed him with an AK-47. So Flatley's hit the deck and tried to return fire, but his weapon's not working. So Boom Boom Billy pulls the section out and they get back to the airfield and in the light, in the tent, and they realise Flatley's got a bullet hole through his sleeve straight through his night vision goggles that are hanging around his neck, one through his rifle, and one through his trouser leg. So that's why his weapon wasn't working. He had a round go through it. But um, he is one lucky son of a bitch. You know, if he, anyone was going to buy a lotto ticket, flatly got it, you know. He should have copped that burst in the chest. But because he turned... Uh, it didn't hit him, it just went so like straight through his not, night, foot, night vision goggles around his neck. Alright, last story. We'll talk about McElhaney, um getting shot, the only guy we lost over there. Um, yeah, I was on front gate duty that night and uh, my section was there and I was, I was listening to the radio. It was about nine o'clock at night or something, you know, and I just scored a Walkman and a Bob Marley tape. So I was pretty wrapped, you know. Anyway, come over the radio, we had a man down in town. We're like, shit, you know. I, we didn't hear any gunfire coming from town. We're like, fuck, you know, man down, you know. So the APC went through the front gate and then it come over the radio, he'd been shot in the chest. Uh, it was one of our boys, you know, and I was thinking, fuck, I hate this place, you know. This, this makes it really serious when one of our boys are hit, you know. <clears throat> so the carrier brought him through and... They got him on the chopper and that's when he died. And uh, they said, he said goodbye to his mates and his mum and dad and told them that he loved them before he passed. But uh, he had a sucking chest wound, so what it, like, we, we thought the Somalis did it, you know, we didn't know what was going on. And then it come out that it was one of our own boys that accidentally shot him. Now, what happened was one of the scouts, his scout, McElhaney was a 2IC two two Lance Corporal, and he noticed the scout was having trouble with his 66 rocket. So McElhaney went forward, this is in the dark, and said, give us your weapon, I'll take the 66 off you and give it to someone else. So the scouts turned around and McElhaney's grabbed the weapon and pulled the barrel towards him. Now, a scout, like there's action and instant. Now, action's a cocked weapon. Instant's when you got your safety catch off. And if you're up the front in the dark, waiting for Somalis to kill you, 
you got your safety catch off. Now when McElhaney pulled the rifle towards him barrel first, uh, the scout's finger pulled the trigger and shot him point blank in the chest. Now there's rumours going around if he didn't have his flak jacket on, the bullet wouldn't have slowed down and churned him up so much inside. It would have been a clean shot, you know, and he might have survived. So the flak jackets are catch-22, you know, we're all wearing them, but are they slow bullets down where they're good for stopping shrapnel? So yeah, that's McElhaney, Shannon. We lost him over there and that, that turned the tide, you know, that, that made a lot of us upset, you know, and uh, yeah, when it gets, the game's serious when you lose one of your boys, you know, it's like, I'll tell you one more story when I got wounded, right? Or two more stories. I'll, we, we, we went to a village for our first food run, right? The whole platoon and 30 trucks full of sorghum. <clears throat> and uh, we pulled up at the village and they swamped us. Thousands of starving people, right? Uh, they swamped us. We didn't know what we were doing. It was our first food drop. And we had sticks to hold them back, you know, and I had my stick and they stunk like cattle, man. They just like all around you, pushing you and fighting and for the food, you know. And I was pushing three pregnant women in the guts, nine months pregnant, with my stick to hold them back. You know, to me, pushing a pregnant woman in the guts with a stick it's not natural to me. You know, it's like pregnant women be gentle with them. But three of them, I was pushing them back. So we learned how to do food drops by separating the men and the women and putting up barbed wire and getting it orderly done, you know? So we learned our lesson there. But at uh, the time I got wounded, we were coming back from a food drop now, we were fucking exhausted because we'd been working 24-7 without fuck all sleep and in the heat, you know, so wherever you could catch a sleep, you'd try and get one. And we're coming back from feeding a, uh, a village and the whole platoon's on trucks and I was asleep and I was woken to a bang and then pain in my jaw and I wake up and I'm pissing blood everywhere. And then someone yells out, Normie's been hit. So I'm like, fuck, I've been shot. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, like all the trucks were stopping and going, nobody knew what to do. We thought we were taking enemy fire. But what had happened was the guy threw up from his weapon discharge the bullet hit the barrel of the guy next to me and turned into a mini grenade. It, uh, a piece of bullet hit me in the jaw. Uh, Smitty up on the gun turret got hit in the back and uh, a couple of the boys got fragged as well, but I copped it in the face. Um, so they took me to the RAP and the guy's feeling around in me face, the medic. And he goes, yep, yep, yep. And I'm like, yep, yep, what? And he goes, the shrapnel's in your jawbone. Stuck in your jawbone. I'm like, all oh, right, oh. So he injected, he goes to me, you want to go to an American hospital and get it cut out? I said, no, nah, no, nah, I just want to be back with the boys, you know? So... So... They said, do you want your mother notified? And I said, no, don't worry about it, I'm all right. You know, I'm, I'm not, I'm doing all right. So the next day they rang my mother and my mother told me her heart stopped. She thought I was dead. You know, they're gonna tell her that I, I was dead, but they told her I was wounded. Now they had to tell her because it was going in the newspaper the next day. First, Aussie diggers wounded from a battalion since Vietnam, you know, so. So, yeah, that was my 
getting wounded and it hurt like fuck, you know. I'd hate to cop a full bullet, you know. Would have taken my jaw completely off. But that, that shrapnel's still in there today. But, um, yeah, okay, I told you a few stories. You know, there's, there's so many stories, you know. It's like six months worth of work, you know, in Somalia, you know. But, um, when I got home, my mate Tim Kitt from the 2nd 4th Battalion, he said to me years later, Normie, when I saw you, you looked straight through me, man. You had the thousand yard stare. He said, uh, I was looking in the eyes of the boys and I knew you guys had had a hard time just by the look in our eyes, you know? So, yeah, yeah. But, uh, okay. There are a few Somalia stories. And uh, I didn't swear much, which is good, because I like to swear when I tell a story, you know, it puts a bit more oomph into it. All right, I'll throw this up. I'll give this to you, George, so if we do make a doco or you want to use this or whatever you like, mate, I'm coach, you know. I'm not afraid to, to talk about Somalia. Uh, I don't know if it's because I'm a radio DJ and I've learned to open up my throat chakra, but um, yeah, yeah, I can I can put stories together and I can tell it the way it was, you know. Okay, salute to the front, salute. See you later. <laughs>